My name is Carolyn. I'm a 53-year-old native of Utah, Salt Lake City. I had a pretty interesting upbringing, nothing out of the ordinary. How was yours? Seriously, how was yours? Ordinary or ordinary-ish? Do you know much about Utah? Okay, I'll just assume you're saying yes. Then we won't have to talk about Utah. People used to tell me uh, to make a movie of my life. I know, I know everyone says that. This was even before I was shot, years before I was shot. Earlier this year, I was sitting around getting ready for Easter with my kids and some friends. We made a ton of boiled eggs. I felt like having one. The eggs had been sitting out for several hours, and I said, I wonder if these have gone bad. Mom, don't eat those, one of my kids said. They might kill you. After all this, after everything I'd been through, that would be how I would go, a hard-boiled egg. When I finally kick it, it's going to be something odd. I'll be leaning down. Uh, the clothes washing machine will be malfunctioning, so there will be water gurgling all over the floor, and the machine door will smack me in the back of the head, and I'll drown in the water. Or I'll choke on quinoa. We used to joke about these things. This was before uh, Kirsten, my daughter, died. We used to joke about all the things I could be killed by. I could list them. <laughs> Would you like me to list them? This isn't tragic. I survived, obviously. I had a stalker for six years. I was in a boat that sank. I was hit by a drunk driver while standing in my own driveway. Growing up, my family always went to Park City, Utah. They owned property up there. They have this quirky parade in Park City every year for the 4th of July. So you get bands of people doing weird things like drumming on dumpsters, but they'd be riding in the dumpster. Just really funny things. So it was 3.30, July 3rd, and I was getting ready to go to Park City with my kids. The doors of the minivan were open. I was getting my son to fill it up with groceries. I'm standing there next to the minivan, and I hear this terrible screeching, crashing noise. And just imagine, all of you, with, imagine this with me. There's a, a red Grand Am driving across my lawn, cherry red, real as anything. He was going 80 miles an hour. He'd already hit a telephone pole. He was sort of careening down the street. Police were behind him. Right next to my car, there's a peach tree and three granite boulders. And he hits those boulders, and it flipped his car up. It curved in the air, dove into my car, and knocked it sideways. My son was all right, but it sent me like a billiard ball in the air. So have you ever seen a drunk driving ad where they tell you to be careful in your driveway. I haven't seen that one either. Uh, so I bounced a few times. I remember getting up and teetering over and thinking, we need to tell the hotel we're going to be late. It was a bad day. I had to give the photos. I had to give the, the doctors a photo of me. That's how they rebuilt my face. So we talk about these things. Do you have someone in your life you talk to about death? Does it come across in conversation? It comes up. It, it was always just there for me, the jokes, the serious talks. Maybe that's healthy. It was the same for Kirsten. I think she was filling in some sort of online questionnaire, something that uh, was passed around Facebook. You know, that sort of thing. I just remember it said, where would you like to travel if you could travel anywhere in the world? And the other question was, how would you like to die? And her answers, this is my daughter Kirsten, her answers were Tuscany and quick and painlessly. So that's why we took that trip to Italy. As for the other answer, well, I know it was quick. Could I tell you more? Are you okay with me telling you more? So imagine that, if you will, all of you. That line, are you OK with me telling you more? That's what's on screen here as part of your reading experience. Are you OK with hearing this? You can choose yes or no. So I'm obviously not this woman. I'm not the woman who's been speaking to you, nor am I from 
Utah. I'm from Vancouver Island. Carolyn, though, is not only a real person. She's one of many people involved in a project that will be published soon. And so I wanted her to come to San Francisco with me in this way, in my efforts at ventriloquism. Um, as Peter might have mentioned, my name is Craig Taylor, and I'm the editor of a magazine called Five Dials. And this project is a collaboration between my magazine and the tech company WeTransfer. And it's called uh, Anything But Guns. So for a lot of it, interviewees, the voices on your screen talk about anything but guns. It's easier in this country, as many of you know, to speak about anything but guns. But it's weird how much in this country winds back to that subject. So uh, this talk today is supposed to be about good, bad journalism, which is a bit of a cop-out um, as far as terms go. I don't want to demean journalism because I'm a journalist. Uh, I'll define it a little bit later. What I will say is that it involves a different kind of intimacy. That's what we're aiming for. There's nothing new, really, out there in terms of storytelling. Um, and sometimes it's good at a place like this to remind everyone, including myself, that these things are millennia old. But we're hoping to bring a woman like Carolyn closer to you all. Um, and I got the feeling, briefly, that you did like her and you liked spending time with her. She's funny. She's sort of amazed at how her life has turned out. And she carries grief. No, no one should ever really know. Um, and so during this project, you choose to interact with a person like Carolyn. It's not a choose your own adventure or anything that branches out too far, but a directed dialogue. And this is pretty new. This is pretty old stuff to, uh, to gamers. She speaks, you choose to listen with her. At one point during your interaction, there's a constellation of dots that appears on your screen. It's really beautiful, like the night sky. And eventually, Carolyn leads you through this story. The images change. She tells you that these are the dots of lead shot in her body. And so this image, this beautiful, peaceful image, is proof that she has more lead in her body right now than anyone else alive. Medical journals have written about her. She can walk you through one of these articles. Uh, Kirsten was shot and killed in a mass shooting in Trolley Square in Utah in 2007. She died uh, next to Carolyn in the floor of a novelty card shop. So Carolyn is one of the many interviewees involved in the project that Five Dials is undertaking. We're providing the interviews, we're writing the scripts, we're traveling the country speaking to people. The designers are providing the means to create something that seems like an easy interaction for readers, a questionnaire that keeps growing with complexity and emotional heft. Um, let me pull back a little further. Five Dials has been around for a while. Its headquarters is in, in the UK. I know I don't have the accent, but it's London-based. Um, we produce, and get ready for it, futurists, we produce a PDF, that primordial old monster. <laughs> um, and once the PDF is sent out to subscribers, each issue is atomized, sent out into the web piece by piece. But we believe in the general interest magazine as a form, especially one that works as people scroll down. We operate on a very, very small budget from Penguin UK. But we publish literary fiction, nonfiction, by the likes of Zadie Smith and Zaybald, Lipsight, Noam Chomsky. Um, we stress the social in a way. We like to have people in the room with us. If you can get to a launch, wherever it may be, you're always welcome. Subscribers get a sense of where each issue is coming from, when the, where someone is hitting send, whether that's Jaipur or Sydney or Brooklyn or Paris. So there's a bit of a belief in the old. Some readers print up the magazine, mostly at work, mostly on someone else's dime. One barrister in London binds each issue with barrister ribbon. So 
So we're inclusive, we're, we're old, I think. It feels old. But we can't get rid of everything. We're not really ready to be done with paper. I do, um, I do like that quote. I think it's a Clay Shirky quote about journalism. Society doesn't need newspapers. What we need is journalism. And so hopefully, in some small way, we can uh, move this forward a little. So what did I mean by good, bad journalism? Well, it's about form, but it's also about reception. These days, we've been thinking a lot about um, about what happened at the beginning of this talk that we just shared. I, I bet you still remember it. You may even still remember the image of a grand am careening across someone's lawn. So why, why did that happen? Why were you receptive to that? Why is it sticking in your mind? Uh, I went to a show in, in New York a little while ago, this artist, Pipilotti Wrist, at the New Museum. And if you don't know her work, if you stumbled across it, you might think it's all about lights and video. She's got this piece, Pixel Forest, where it's a, it's a forest of light, just crystal cocoons glowing on these long strands hanging from the ceiling. She has other pieces where screens showing videos of water rushing over a person's bare calf or a finger tracing a seam in a rock or seaweed or you'll see cool seawater lapping at a beach. But afterwards I realized that this artist, Rist, is, is offering a very successful answer to the question of reception. How do we get people to stay with us and, and look? If you're like her, you screen these pieces, you project them on the ceiling and you offer up to the audience a series of beds, couches, and cushions. I don't know um, if what you guys are like, but when I see video installation, I often nudge into a room, watch it for a second, and then shuffle out. But on a bed, lying down on these couches, cushions, in the new museum, I was receptive. And I watched the entire piece as more water washed over the hands, the seaweed. So do we really think of reception? In our first collaboration with, with WeTransfer, we, we built a reading experience. I know I should show you it, but you can track it down. I'm sure you will. The aim was to just keep readers involved, and it took the form of a questionnaire about music. What's your favorite genre? That sort of thing. And readers entered this very bland looking questionnaire and took part in it step by step, question by question, and until, until it became evident that the questionnaire was in fact a short story, a piece of fiction. Characters appeared. The voice asking you these questions became sentient. They interrogated the reader. The form took a swerve from the expected to the unexpected. David Bowie made an appearance. It's not, it's not exactly earth-shattering material. It was quite a slight story, but we found that people kept going, and anyone involved in reading wants to get readers to keep going. They kept clicking little by little, screen by screen, and they were receptive to this form. They eventually ingested the story. People lingered for 10 minutes. And if you work at newspapers, you know that's an eternity. As a writer and editor, I'm very suspicious of, of forms that serve no purposes, and I'm sure you've all felt that strange sensation, the thrill of seeing a new app, a new way of reading, a new initiative, and then that creeping, awful feeling that it's just not necessary. So we try to uh, focus on the unsexy ways of keeping people around, reception. So how do we incrementally guide people through the reading experience? How do we incrementally guide our readers? Our music questionnaire was fun. By the time the story ended, the reader was far, far away, visually and narratively. So how could this form be used for something more? Could it be used for nonfiction? Is it a form of journalism? In the form, there's reticence, there's hesitation. The voice questions the reader. There are moments to challenge the reader. And that challenge resonates because of the constructed intimacy. We call it directed storytelling, for lack of a better term. But let me uh, 
come back to where we started. I'll come back to, to Carolyn. What we're creating with, his, with her story is for lack of a better term, bad journalism. We say we, we want to have conversations about guns. I'm not sure if that's actually true. So what if the voice you were interacting with confronted your hesitation and offered a way out if you weren't comfortable? And how would you feel taking that way out? Is that indicative of a larger problem? Do you want to go deeper? Do you want to hear more? Can I tell you about Kirsten's towel? The voice on the screen asks you. At that point, you can click on what do you mean by towel? And Carolyn will say, her words on the screen will say, look, we don't have to do this. We don't have to go through this. It's easier not to. It's, it's, it's happening out there, but it doesn't have to be in your life. It's easier to not know the details. You've edged through the story with her. Readers, as I mentioned, stuck with our music questionnaire for about 10 minutes. It never asks too much of you, just, just one click further. But the texture, the arc of gun violence storytelling is so similar. The initial blurred footage, helicopter footage, dashboard footage, people scattering, worried anchors, pundits, both parties shaken, but not as shaken as they used to be last month or the month before, then op-eds, and that old rhythm of thoughts and prayers and thoughts and prayers and thoughts and prayers. So you decide to go on with Carolyn. Can I tell you about Kirsten's towel? Ask Carolyn's voice written out on your screen. You can, that's just one of the choices. It's just a towel, she says. A couple weeks after Kirsten was shot in a Salt Lake City mall, I went into her bedroom. She was so messy, not just clothes, but dishes. It was practically archeological, you know, layers upon layers. Do you know what that looks like? I know what that looks like. You might choose, it's your reply. The first time I went into her little ensuite bathroom, I noticed the towel on her floor and I could see the faint marking of her feet, the outline of her feet. It's so strange. I could see the definition between each toe as if she just stepped out of the steam and the water. Could I tell you more? Those words on your screen will ask, not much more, not all at once. Just a little more. The words will appear slowly across your screen. Will you let me tell you about the day she was shot? I hope you'll go with her. Thanks very much.